The next bit I'm going to talk about will be biotechnology. Having looked through the whole chapter, I largely put them into five different categories, but then you need to know these five categories at different sorts of levels of details in some sense. So number one, we'll talk about food production, and then we'll have a little think about medicine and bioremediation. Um, then there's a massive part about culturing in which you need to know. And then finally, immobilized enzymes, which sort of seems like a bit of a standalone, really. Uh, but then you also need to know some stuff about it. Again, I'm just going to outline some of the general things that you need to be aware of, some of the key things you need to pay attention to. Lots of the details, make sure you do um, focus on these, out based on these outlines when you're doing your revision. So I'm going to start off with food production. Right, simply put, food production, there are two major parts. One would be direct food production, and the other one would be indirect. Let's start with indirect first. So indirect food production means that you start with food A, and then you are using the microorganisms to turn it into food B. Whereas for direct food production, you have the actual microorganism directly making the food that you want. Right, so that's the difference. So some of the examples for indirect food production will be cheese and bread. So for example, you are changing um, the dairy products, okay, and then you're fermenting it um, and then turning it into cheese or just flour or dough, you put in a bit of yeast and you turn it into bread. Right, so it's again relying on microorganisms to make that. The one example of direct food production will be corn. So in this case, they're using fungi as the uh, microorganism and they make sure they genetically engineer it or whatever and that making that fungi produce proteins right, to solve the world uh, protein sh shortage problem. And so that's an example where you're using the microorganisms, fungi in this case, directly producing protein. So those are two bits that you need to be aware of. Now, in terms of medicine, uh, without going into masses uh, of detail, there are two specific examples that you need to be aware of. One is insulin. Right? And you know, you've learned a lot about genetically engineering bacteria to make insulin. That's like the classic example. So make sure you're aware of that. Uh, the other one example would be penicillin, knowing that uh, it's made from fungi and it is a secondary metabolite that is produced from the growth of fungi. So linking a lot to culturing actually in some sense, but then just be aware. These are the two examples of medicine that we can uh, think about in biotechnology, relying on microorganisms to make stuff. And then the third part about bioremediation, um, there isn't much that you need to know about bioremediation, except for the fact is it is the process in which we're removing uh, or breaking down any sort of pollutants from the environment. So it is very much a focus on protecting the environment, keeping it clean and everything, or try to remove anything that's been contaminated. Uh, there are two aspects to this. You can use natural organisms to do this, or you can use genetically engineering uh, organisms to finish this process. So for example, in, an example of natural would be using algae to clean uh, sewage water. A GM organism example would be genetically modify some of the bacteria that exist on the seabed to enhance their ability to break down crude oil uh, in the sea. So for example, uh, if there's an oil spill, all they need to do is to chuck those GM bacteria into the sea and they will naturally eat away the, um, the, the, the spilled oil rather than burning it off, which creates lots of uh, pollution problems as well. Then uh, we're going to have a think about culturing. It's quite a big part of biotechnology and there's most of the information, most of the stuff that you need to know is within this sector. And I'm going to split that up into different parts. So first of all, just be aware of the fact that we can consider culturing in two different settings. One will be considering in a lab setting and the other one will be in an industry setting. Simply put, you might have done an experiment in the lab uh, where you have to culture some of the bacteria. That's one of the required uh, practicals that you need to do. Um, just be aware so we can do it in terms of using broth. Okay, it's basically liquid way of culturing bacteria. Or we can put it into agar gel, which is probably the way that you've done, is to plating bacteria on it. There is a whole chunk about aseptic techniques, you know, knowing how to uh, plate bacteria or transfer microorganisms using agar plates and inoculating techniques to avoid any sort of contamination. That's aseptic techniques. That's one of the key parts in culturing 
in biotechnology because, like I said earlier, if you've got any sort of contamination, the whole patch is ruined and you can't use any of the products that you make through that process. In industry, rather than using petri dishes with agar gel or bottles with broth, we use a much bigger tank, which we called a which we call a bioreactor. There are two types. Uh, one of the types is a batch format of it, so it's a one-off thing. So you just got a tank where you put all the stuff in and then you seal it, like so, and then you just let it ferment all everything inside, and at the end, you use up the whole batch. Right? And obviously, you need to have a bit more downstream processing to purify everything else. Or you can do it as a continuous culture where you have a tank, but you leave some spaces in between. It's, it's designed to have things going in when, the, when they run out. So for example, nutrients and oxygen, everything. And also you're taking things away actively uh, at the end. So your product can be, uh, can be extracted from there. And there are lots of tubes, etc., to make sure that you maintain the conditions inside. So these are the two different ways that we can do culturing in, in the industry. So just be aware. You might be asked to compare which one's better. Then again, just think about thinking think about a contamination or the resources needed, etc. One major part about culturing that you need to be very, very clear about is something called the standard growth curve. Right, so these are the th uh, four different stages of the standard growth curve. You need to know what they are and you need to be able to explain why that is the case. One key thing when it comes to explaining the different stages is always, always comparing the birth rate and the death rate. Always, always when you are describing and explaining this particular part. You must make sure you do that. So for example, the first stage is what we call the lag phase meaning that the birth rate and the death rate is about the same, that's why it's flat. And that's because the microorganisms are still getting used to the environment. So hence why the bacterial count in this case is, doesn't change much, that's just how much you put in. So second bit is the log phase or the exponential phase, where the, ex the bacteria is used to the environment now, there is no limiting factors, there's virtually unlimited nutrients and oxygen, lots of spaces for them to grow, no competition whatsoever, so therefore there's a massive growth. So birth rate is higher, much higher than death rate in log phase. The third stage is called the stationary phase, again, it's starting to have a bit of competition. So the birth rate and the death rate is pretty much equal at that stage. So again, a bit of fluctuations, but pretty much the same. And finally, this is called the death phase, where obviously, as the name implies, death rate is much higher than birth rate because there's lots more competition, nutrients start to become way more limiting, toxic waste built up, etc., in the tank, and therefore leading to death. This usually describes a batch fermentation. Uh, if it's in a continuous one, you'll probably make sure you maintain it too, so that it's you can keep getting stuff from it. So this is usually in batch. You must make sure you know how to describe and explain the graph if they give it to you by comparing birth and death rate. The last part in terms of culturing is thinking about the factors to control when you're fermenting something to make sure that there is optimum growth for your uh, bacteria or your microorganisms. Number one, temperature. Microorganisms do aerobic respiration and perhaps anaerobic respiration during the process. It's an exothermic reaction, therefore you need to make sure it's going to get heated up. You must make sure it keeps the same, otherwise enzymes will start to denature at the high temperatures. Second one will be pH, right? The product, one of the products of uh, respiration is carbon dioxide. It can easily be dissolved in the water in the surrounding solution, lowering the pH because they form carbo carbonic acid in water. So you need to make sure you maintain the pH, again, not to denature the enzymes in the microorganisms. Of course, oxygen and glucose and other sort of mineral ions will be crucial for the microorganisms to use in terms of the growth while they're doing respiration, etc. So you need to make sure that they are there so that they have enough stuff to react with in order to grow. Last thing will be waste levels. Um, again, carbon dioxide can be made. In certain situations, there are side products that, uh, that can be created during their normal life cycle, like primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. Some of which can be useful, uh, they could, probably will be the product that you want, for example penicillin, which is a secondary metabolite. However, they, we, they can also produce other things such as carbon dioxide, which is toxic and can kill your microorganisms or other sort of things. So you need to make sure that they are actively removed to make sure that there is optimal growth. One other thing that you can uh, probably need to consider as well is 
asepsis, uh, which is a fancy term for saying aseptic techniques, or the idea that you're keeping your culture free from contamination. So making sure that you're wearing gloves, goggles, um, avoid talking over it so that your saliva and other sort of microorganisms doesn't get into your culture. So just general ideas, things like, things like that, making sure that it's free of contamination. Right, so that's culturing. It's a major part, so just very quickly, a few things. You can do it in a lab setting or an industry, industrial setting. Key thing you need to know is the standard growth curve. This, you need to be able to describe and explain it by comparing the birth rate and the death rate of the four different stages within the curve. Um, be aware of what are the factors to control. Be able to explain why we control them. So what are the, basically what are the consequences if we don't? And perhaps some of the extension questions will be, okay, how can we make sure we control it in a bioreactor, for example? So just be aware of those. So the last aspect of biotechnology is the immobilized enzymes. There are largely two parts that you need to be aware of. Number one is the methods of doing so. Now, there are four methods that you need to know. They can be categorized into two different uh, groups. Number one is surface immobilization. What that is, is saying that, okay, we're now just uh, having the enzymes and we're going to try and stick it onto, let's say, a board or a flat surface of some sort. One of the methods is called adsorption. Notice that it's it, it's adsorption with a D, not absorption, which is a B. That's totally different. So uh, that's, that's one of them, where they're just simply sticking the enzymes on the surface. Or perhaps you can have uh, ionic or covalent bonding to carriers. They're both very similar. It's kind of just the same thing about sticking enzymes on the surface. However, adsorption is using some weaker bonds. So it's a bit more flexible. They can move about a little bit more, but easier to be lost in, in the solution. Whereas for bonding to carriers, they're using ionic and covalent bonding, which is way stronger. So it's harder for them to be lost, which is good. However, there is less flexibility in terms of the active side and the enzyme. So perhaps the efficiency is not as high as adsorption. So the other group of method will, is called entrapment. So as the name implies, you're putting the enzymes, trapping it into certain uh, uh, substances. There are two ways to do this. Number one is using uh, trapping them in the matrix. So it's almost like a lattice. Or the other one would be trapping the enzymes into capsules, so like beads. So a matrix is sort of like um, you can have wells. That is basically different fibers that uh, become like a well, and then you can have the enzymes trapped in between those fibers, so the gaps in between. Whereas for a capsule is you've got lots and lots of beads, like so, and the enzymes are all trapped inside those beads. So these are the two different methods. In comparison to surface immobilization, it's probably more stable because it's more protected inside certain things, uh, so you can pretty much be guaranteed that you're not going to lose any enzymes. However, the Material to make them is a bit more expensive, and also, you know, the efficiency is not as high because the substrates have to diffuse into the matrix, into the capsules, or into the jelly that makes them. Um, so efficiency is not as high. So here comes the very last part about immobilized enzymes and the whole of biotechnology, which is the pros and cons of uh, immobilized enzymes. Now, there are a few things. Obviously, when we think about the pros and cons, it's usually in the context of comparing it to something else. Um, so either it could be comparing the different methods, which I briefly mentioned earlier, or it could have different levels of comparing. Number one, it could be comparing the cells with isolated enzymes, as in just having an enzyme solution that you often use in school or also comparing the isolated enzyme solutions with immobilized enzymes. So these are the different levels. Again, just largely thinking about, a f there are three aspects that you need to consider when thinking about pros and cons. Number one, scientific wise, uh, is the purity of the product. The idea about immobilizing enzymes is so that we can collect the enzyme solution right afterwards without too much processing of the product, because usually you end up with the enzyme and the product mixed together in the solution. Next thing to consider is the cost. How much does it cost to make them? But then how much does it cost for downstream processing? Are we cutting costs there as well? So this is one of the things you need to consider. And then is the efficiency of them. In most cases, it's probably going to ask what are the advantages of using immobilized enzymes in comparison to isolated enzymes? That tends to be the case. So it's quite a lot of information, but simply put, 
Number one, food production, direct and indirect food production. Just be aware of what the examples are and be ready to illustrate one of uh, the pros and cons as well. Medicine, there are two types, insulin and penicillin are the key ones that you need to be aware of, um, but that's pretty much it. Being aware that you can use microorganisms to make these two things. Lots of links of making insulin by genetic engineering in chapter 21. Then be aware bioremediation is the process in which we use microorganisms to clean the environment, namely genetic engineered bacteria to clean oil spills. Culturing, a big part, you can have two types, then you need to be very much aware of the standard growth curve, describe and explain the graph, and the factors to control. Then finally, immobilize enzymes, which is very different from the rest that, that we've been talking about. Be aware of the four different methods, absorption, bonding to carriers, matrix and capsules, and the pros and cons comparing immobilized enzymes to isolated enzymes. And these are the key things in biotechnology.